Hey guys, welcome back to the Crime Time Podcast with Alexandra. For this week's podcast, we're going to be discussing chapters 19 through 37. And I'm going to be doing this podcast a little bit more differently now. We're going to be discussing literary devices and who I think has done it. So let's get started. To start off with literary devices, I want to discuss two similes that I found really important. The first one being, quote unquote, me holding up like a sand crab. In this scene, Kaya observes Chase and his group of friends. She explains the main difference between them and her, how they are carefree and can enjoy time together, and she is holed up like a sand crab. Sand crabs are known for hiding out under the sand and don't come out unless it is absolutely necessary, something Kaya knows very, very well. Kaya, in a way, experiences life like a sand crab, only coming out when she needs to get gas or necessities from the Piggly Wiggly or from jumpings. So in a way, she really is a sand crab. So that's why I think that simile was very important. Kind of shows the relationship between her and the townspeople. For the other simile, quote unquote, continue to look in the direction of the boat as a deer eyes the empty brush of a departed panther. In this scene, we saw Kaya in her natural habitat and how she acts when she's fully comfortable. She is very cautious and paranoid when it comes to people that she doesn't know. And this really caused the final drift between Kaya and Tate. Tay took this as a sign that she would never be able to fit in the world that he had to be in in order to succeed, which is surrounded by others who lived the life that he wanted, which is nothing like the way Kaya lived. He needed to surround himself with people who were also dedicated to their craft and wanted to be better in life. Not saying that Kaya didn't want to be better in life, but she just wasn't on the same plan or track as Tay was. Either way, I feel like that breakup could have been avo- avoided if he had just asked Kaya what she wanted and gave her the choice but then again Kaya I feel like with her trauma of abandonment she would have jumped at the gun and would have been like yes yes I'll go with you knowing that she really didn't want to go or that she didn't want to live that life either way I think Tate was very wrong for what he did and he needs to be held a little bit more accountable by that (laughs) but anyway let's move on to symbolism For symbolism, I put, quote unquote, he looked at some butterflies briefly, but quickly lost interest. Thought, why keep stuff you can see right outside your door? I think this could be symbolism because the butterflies made me think of Kaya in this instance. Butterflies are beautiful, majestic creatures that are targeted by many predators, and yet they can prevail in almost any situation. But Chase thinking this as he looks at the butterflies lets me know that he does not think outside the box, could be quick to lose interest in things, or just doesn't see the value in them. I think this was also a symbol to how the relationship between them was going to end. They are too different to be in a relationship, polar opposites if you want to be real about it. And I think Kaya knew this from the beginning. Not I think, like I I know she knew that is too much. But she continues the relationship as a way to sort of cure her loneliness and her trauma of abandonment. That's what I think really kept her in the relationship. It wasn't that she loved him or anything like that she just didn't want to be lonely and now let's get into hyperbole quote unquote you said you loved me but there is no such thing there is no one on earth you can count on honestly a lot of what kaya said when she was going through her breakup with tate was a hyperbole to me and okay don't cancel me but she kind of made it hard for me to read it because i'm definitely the the type of person who gets over something the same day and keeps it pushing but in her defense she was going through a lot and she was already dealing with trauma so all of these emotions at once just maybe she just couldn't handle them so i'll give her the benefit of the doubt her betrayal and confusion can all cause very overwhelming feelings and that's why i consider this line a hyperbole kaya knows that she has two people who love her dearly and that she can count on which are jumping and mabel and yet this young boy made her feel as though she had no one when she clearly had two shoulders to cry on but then again I mean, it sort of gets excused because she's never really had anybody or anybody to depend on. So it could still very, it could still feel very foreign to her and she just doesn't know how to navigate it. Now let's get into juxtaposition. Quote unquote, their squeals made Kaya's silence even louder. I think this is a contrasting idea because as Chase's friend group continues to get louder and have more fun, Kaya's loneliness and silence grows along with it. I also think it served as a way to further isolate Kaya from the rest of the people as it showed us that Kaya just can't fit into that social circle that Chase and his friends had. And that's why I think she gets stuck observing them from afar and never being able to join them. 
because she knows she just can't fit into that world and she just simply doesn't want to let's put it that way and finally let's get into personification quote unquote now all the pieces lay beneath her and she saw her friend's full face for the first time as i stated in episode one of the crime time podcast the marsh was the quote-unquote person who raised and took care of kaya and in this scene once she got to the very top of the fire tower she was able to see the entirety of the marsh or as she describes it, her friend's face. This example of personification shows us how highly she thinks of the marsh and how it's not just a piece of land to her, but her friend. Kaya has been through so much in such a short amount of time and the marsh was always there to catch her when she fell. The relationship between Kaya and the marsh is really unique to me. It kind of made me think that the marsh was sort of the mother she never had in a way, but she did have the mother at first. She just didn't have it long enough, you know? So I think the marsh was really, really good for her. And I think this scene was very sentimental for her and for readers as well. Because I just, I remember reading that scene for the first time and it just hit like, it hit an emotion, man. It was so nice to read. She seems very happy and very in tune with herself. So now let's get into my favorite part, who I think has done it. So throughout chapters 19 through 37, we were presented with a lot of evidence. So let me go over it with you. Chase has something going on with Kaya for four years and was very secretive about it. A shell necklace was not found on Chase's body, even though he wore it for four years straight and never took it off. Patty confirmed that it would be impossible for the necklace to fly off or get stuck somewhere else. The knot on the necklace was simply too complicated for it to do that. No footprints or fingerprints were found, only the red wool fibers. Patty Love, Chase's mom, does not think his murder was an accident. Patty also thinks that somebody would have had to take the necklace off. Patty firmly believes that this someone who had to have taken the necklace was Kaya herself. And at first, Sheriff Ed was not convinced that a woman could have pushed Chase, but then he later comes around to the idea. Hal Miller and Alan Hunt claim that they saw Kaya going, Kaya going toward the fire tower just before Chase died. Kaya finds out about Chase's secret engagement with Pearl Stone, Tate Walker claims Kaya was in Greenville for two nights, the night that Chase died and the morning after. Pansy Price claims that she can testify to the dates and time Kaya was going on the bus to Greenville and back. And the red wool fibers that were at the scene matched a red wool hat found in Kaya's shack. So, let's dissect this. With all the evidence presented, I think it's becoming harder who I think has done it. But I still do have a gut feeling that it could have been one of Chase Andrews' lover. But listen to this. With all this evidence, I think Kaya has something to do with it. 100%. I think she was sort of an accomplice in this murder. So this is my theory as of right now. I think Kaya told Pearl Stone for what, what, whatever reason. And Stone became enraged that Chase could cheat on her with some, someone like Kaya. We know Kaya faces a lot of prejudice from everybody in the town so i think this would definitely send his fiance over the edge and maybe they were arguing at the fire tower and pearl pushed him off could have been accidental could have been on purpose but either way chase died i also think that kaya perhaps was in on this and he she helped pearl with this i think kaya offered to help because chase had done her dirty either way so she did both of them dirty really so I think Kaya was more than willing to help because there's no way. I think Kaya was on the cleanup or yeah, like this is not like more than a two person job. That sounded like it was more than two, but I think Kaya did the cleaning up because there's no way somebody like Pearl would have been able to clean up the scene like that. Like it just looks completely wiped, like nothing had been through it. But the more I think about my theory, it kind of seems impossible because I'm not sure if Kaya would be the kind of person to tell Pearl because she's not really like, she doesn't like interacting with people, nor does she like causing trouble. But honestly, you never know. Like I did say in podcast one, rage can make you do anything, anything and everything. So maybe Kaya did feel like that and she did take that chance and tell Pearl. But then again, the chances of that being true are like slim to none. But that's just what I think so far. So thank you again for tuning in. I can't wait to see you for episode three of the Crime Time Podcast. Bye-bye.